Hi, thank you for tuning into this Bible study. Today we're going to be talking about Exodus chapter 29, in which we look at the consecration process, the ordination of Aaron as the first high priest, his sons as the priests with him, but also the um, standing ordinance that this will be for the tabernacle and its use, the sacrificial system. In the consecration process, we're going to see three offerings that are done. We're going to see a sin offering, a burnt offering, and a wave offering. We'll talk about all three of those. Um, it's really a, a sanctification is the process of being set apart. And we're going to talk about the difference between uh, consecration and sanctification, but that's really what this is all about, is setting apart the high priest, the priesthood for the service of God, the tabernacle, and the people. So would you join me in prayer and let's dig into this. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this time. I pray that you will speak through me, that these will be your words, not mine, that you'll teach us something about your character. Teach us about your desire to dwell with us, what that meant for Israel in Moses' day and what that means for us today. We praise you, Lord, and we thank you. Amen. Okay, so as we look at Exodus 29, it actually is mirrored in Leviticus 8 uh, we, we, in, in this consecration process. So here are all the elements that happen. We have the priest is washed, that's verse 4, as well as Leviticus 8, 6. The priest is clothed. We talked all about the clothing last week when we looked at Exodus 28, but that's covered in verses 5, 6, 8, and 9, as well as 29 and 30. That's also covered in Leviticus 8, 7 through 9, as, as well as 8, 13. The priests were anointed. That's covered in verse 7, as well as 21, as well as Leviticus 8, 10 through 12, and Leviticus 8, 30. Uh, the priests were forgiven. That's Exodus 29, 10 through 14. So verses 10 through 14 today. The priests were completely dedicated to God. Get dedicated to God. That's verses 15 through 18 today. And then Leviticus 8, 18 through 21 also covers that. The priests were marked by the blood. We're going to see that in verses 19 through 22, as well as you can read that in Leviticus 8, 22 through 24. The priests were fed. Uh, that's verses 22 through 28, as well as 31 through 34, and Leviticus 8, 25 through 29. And finally, the priests are charged to minister daily. This is to be a lasting ordinance that is to continue, and that's the very end, um, verses 38 through 46. So before I open up the text and we start reading, I want to define what consecration is means. It's an interesting word and support one that we define. Looking it up in blueletterbible.org, um, the Hebrew word is melaim, I believe is how you pronounce that, melaim. It occurs nine times in Exodus, five of which are in Exodus chapter 29, what we're studying today. It occurs seven times in Leviticus. Six of those seven times are in chapter eight, as I mentioned before. Uh, Blue Letter Bible references uh, this definition, the devoting or setting apart of anything to the worship or service of God. Abraham and his descendants, the tribe of Levi, were thus consecrated. And that's Exodus 13.2, 13.12, 13.15, uh, as well as Numbers 3.12. The Hebrews devoted their fields and cattle and sometimes the spoils of war to the Lord. We get that in Leviticus 27, verses 28 and 29. According to the Mosaic law, the firstborn both of man and beast were consecrated to God. In the New Testament, Christians are regarded as consecrated to the Lord. We get that from 1 Peter 2, 9, which reads, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Now, Consecration is similar to sanctification. The difference, the, the, there's definitely differences, but uh, consecration is a moment in which something is set apart, whether it's a person or a thing. Sanctification is a process. It is to be set apart. It's continual process of regeneration, which started the moment that you were saved, and it will continue until you meet the Lord, whether through resurrection, uh, um, um, 
the rapture of the church or rather through death. Either way, that is when the sanctification process is complete. It is a continual process that we go through of trying to die to self and allow Christ to change us from the inside out. Sanctified is to be set apart in the same way that consecrate is to be set apart, set apart. but the sanctification process is an ongoing one that never ends for the Christ follower. I hope that helps. Um, Philippians 1.6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Other verses that you can look into and in looking at sanctification, 2 Corinthians 4.6, Colossians 3.10, 1 Corinthians 6.11, as well as verse 19, and then 2 Thessalonians 2.13. All great verses to read talking about sanctification. So Exodus 29 outlines a public consecration service that would set apart the high priest and his sons as God's servants. It's an interesting thing to note that in the past few chapters, Exodus 25 through 28, we are seeing the commands given by God to Moses for the different elements of the tabernacle. Very detailed instructions. But we are going to see those instructions played out and almost repeat. So God says to Moses, build this. And then uh, when we look at chapters 35 through 39, you're going to see, and the people built this. And it's going to spell it out. There's a lot of repeats. That's not the case with Exodus 29. The other thing to note is, is that when we receive this in Exodus 29, the tabernacle hasn't actually been built. So this isn't, this ordination process, consecration process, isn't happening here and now. It's instructions for what to do. It is believed that it, it, it took place right around Exodus 40. Exodus 40, the very last chapter of Exodus, is where we actually see Moses complete and put the tabernacle together, consecrate the tabernacle, and we see God fill the Holy of Holies and dwell with his people, which we're also going to talk about that today. So this element of when did this happen, it's believed that it happened the same day as the tabernacle was actually um, started and consecrated, that the high priests were also consecrated on that day. So now we're going to break this up into chunks, and the first chunk we're going to read is verses 1 through 9. So join me and turn to Exodus 29, and we're going to read verses 1 through 9, which is basically an overview of what is about to happen in the consecration process. Verse 1, this is what you are to do to consecrate them, so that they may serve me as priests. Take a young bull and two rams without defect, and from the finest wheat flour, make round loaves without yeast, thick loaves without yeast and without olive oil mixed in, and thin loaves without yeast and brushed with olive oil. Put them in a basket and present them along with the bowl and the two rams. Then bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance to the tent of meeting and wash them with water. Take the garments and dress Aaron with the tunic, the robe of the ephod, the ephod itself, and the breastpiece. Fasten the ephod on him by its skillfully woven waistband. Put the turban on his head and attach the sacred emblem to the turban. That's the gold plate. I spoke about that last week. Verse 7, take the anointing oil and anoint him by pouring it on his head. Bring his sons and dress them in tunics and fasten caps on them. Then tie sashes on Aaron and his sons. The priesthood is theirs by a lasting ordinance. So as we look at this... Um, this is basically a summary of what's going to happen in the rest of chapter 29. It explains all the things that happened, but we're going to go into detail with each of those different types of offerings, starting with the sin offering in verse 10. But there's three types of sacrifices that are outlined that we're going to talk about. A bull is to be sacrificed as a sin offering, then a ram as a burnt offering, and then another ram as a wave offering. The order of these is significant. The sin offering was designed to cleanse the worshiper of their sin. The priest needed to be first cleansed from their past sins. The burnt offering is an expression of devotion and commitment. So they cleanse themselves of their, their sin, and then they commit themselves to the Lord. Then the wave offering, which is the second ram, a loaf of bread, a cake made without olive, and a wafer, we will discuss all of these um, offerings and sacrifices and what they mean as we go into each. 
So a few things to hit on as we look at these first uh, nine verses. In verse one, without defect. This is a huge uh, critical element of the sacrifice sacrificial process is that the animal or even you heard the grain, it needs to be uh, without defect. I did a search in Blue Letter Bible um, without defect in quotes for the number of times that the phrase without defect is included. 98 times the, the pairing without defect occur in 47 verses in the, the NIV. 18 of those 47 occurrences happen in Leviticus, 17 of them in Numbers, and 8 of them in Ezekiel. It's clearly a very critical element as it relates to the sacrificial system without blemish. This also is one of the, the Jesus in Matthew 21, when he goes into the uh, temple during Holy Week, if you recall, he throws over all the tables and he says, well, literally this is what it says, uh, Matthew 21, 12, and 13. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. So what was happening is that the priests were taking advantage of the people. One of the first steps when you brought your animal to be sacrificed, when you came into uh, the courtyard, it would be inspected to see if it truly was an animal without defect. And what ended up happening eventually is that when this, this process was put into place in the temple, the way the priests would turn it into a den of robbers or thieves is that they would inspect this lamb that was brought in by a person and say, ah, see, it has a defect here. We can't use this one. You have to buy this one. And they would charge just crazy sums of money. It's the same thing as trying to buy something at the airport or at a sporting game. It's a hot dog that costs 35 cents to make, but they're going to charge you $10 for it at a sports arena or even $15 because you can't leave to go get it somewhere else. In the same way, the high priests have a monopoly on this and they were taking advantage of that. You could have an old lady who saved up all of her money and bought um, a lamb and then raised it to be that perfect spotless lamb, a humongous sacrifice for her. Uh, in, in the amount of money and time that was invested into that. And that was the significant thing, was the amount of time and energy and money, the sacrifice that it was to that individual. And then for the priest to say, no, this is not worthy to be sacrificed. You must use this one, which costs double what you paid and saved up for this. Um, and so that's where we see Jesus in Matthew 21, 12 to 13, say that you've turned uh, a house of prayer into a den of thieves. Jesus is our spotless, perfect lamb. This is a picture of the fact that Jesus is our sin offering, our burnt offering, without defect. He was without sin. Though fully man, he never sinned. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life, handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. This uh, without defect points to the fact that Jesus alone is the only one worthy uh, of opening the scroll and saving our souls. He alone was worthy. Another thing to mention in verse 2, uh, without yeast, from the finest wheat flour, yeast and, uh, excuse me, from the finest wheat flours make from the finest wheat flour, make round loaves without yeast. Again, I did a search on Blue Letter Bible without yeast in quotes, and that occurs 63 times in 23 verses. Nine of those 26 verses are in Exodus, nine are in Leviticus. Jesus in Matthew 16, 5 through 12, uses yeast of the Pharisees as an example and an illustration of how sin can work its way into a person, into a people group in the same way that yeast, a small amount of yeast works its way through a loaf of bread and causes it to have effect and change. You can read Matthew 16 for that illustration that he gives uh, to the disciples. I love the fact that the way that that comes up um, 
when Jesus says, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees, the disciples look at each other and they're like, uh, Jesus is mad because we forgot to bring the bread. Did you bring the bread? What, who was supposed to bring the bread? Someone was supposed to bring the bread. Jesus is obviously upset at us. And then Jesus, no doubt, rolled his eyes and goes, no, guys, I'm talking metaphorically, the yeast of the Pharisees. Be, be wary that it doesn't work its way into you uh, and to your teaching. So again, read that. But I love uh, throughout our Bible, we see the humanity of God's chosen people. He uses normal everyday people. Uh, Verse four, you see tent of meeting. Uh, As we discussed with the tabernacle, that is one of the titles of the tabernacle. It does not mean that it was the meeting place uh, where people would gather together to meet and have discussions, a town hall gathering place. No, it is the place where they went to meet with God. The tent of meeting is the tent of meeting with God. And then verse nine, it is to be a lasting ordinance. We will discuss this more uh, when we hit verses 27 through 42. So now let's read verses 10 through 14 as we look at the sin offering. Bring the bull to the front of the tent of meeting and Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on its head, slaughter it in the Lord's presence at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Take some of the bull's blood and put it on the horns of the altar with your finger and pour out the rest of it at the base of the altar. Then take all of the fat of the internal organs, the long lobe of the liver, and both kidneys with the fat on them, and burn them on the altar. But burn the bull's flesh and its hide and its intestines outside the camp. It is a sin offering. Now, we did get some elements of a burnt offering in there, but the sin offering, um, purification offering is another word for it. Um, verse 36 uses that same same Hebrew word. This offering was designed to cleanse the worshiper from their sins. Hebrews 13, 11, and 12 says, The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Jesus is our sin offering. It is through his sacrifice that our sins, past, present, and future, are atoned for. Exodus 29, 15 through 18. Continuing on, we're going to look at the burnt offering. Verses 15 through 18. Take one of the rams, and Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on its head. Slaughter it and take the blood and splash it against the sides of the altar. Cut the ram into pieces and wash the internal organs and the legs, putting them with the head and the other pieces. Then burn the entire ram on the altar. It is a burnt offering to the Lord, a pleasing aroma, a food offering presented to the Lord. A burnt offering or a food offering to the Lord. This is the oldest form of sacrifice or offering that we have in our Bible. Uh, Genesis 4.4 talks about Abel's offer. And we don't know, but many scholars believe that it was a burnt offering that was done. We do know that in Genesis 8.20, Noah's offer to the Lord was a burnt offering. And Genesis 22, where Abraham is called to sacrifice his son Isaac, As you recall, he is setting up a burnt offering. God gives him a ram to do as the final burnt offering. But all of these are examples of burnt offerings. The Hebrew word study, burnt offering, uh, ola is the Hebrew word, which means to ascend, stairway, or steps. Literally means to ascend. It is a soothing aroma to the Lord. We just read that. A pleasing aroma to the, the Lord. Leviticus 1.9 says a soothing aroma to the Lord. A burnt offering was an acknowledgement of sin and a request for a new, renewed relationship with God. It was an expression of devotion and commitment made by the worshiper unto God. GotQuestions.org is a fun, uh, great resource to use. Uh, It is a resource where a group of biblical scholars answer questions. So you can submit your question, and then it'll be reviewed and then answered, and then a panel uh, will review the answer as written to make sure that it is scriptural. I don't use gotquestions.org as doctrine, but I use it as a great resource to help me find sources, Bible verses, and to get me uh, kind of moving in the right direction 
Scripture is the best answer for everything. The best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. But gotquestions.org is a great resource. And this is what they say uh, as it relates to a burnt offering. A person gave a burnt offering at any time. It was a sacrifice of general atonement, an acknowledgement of the sin nature and a request for renewed relationship with God. God also set times for the priest to give a burnt offering for the benefit of the Israelites as a whole, although the animals required for each sacrifice did vary. Every morning and evening, a burnt offering was to be given. That's in uh, verses 38 through 42 of Exodus 29. It's also outlined in Numbers 28 too. A burnt offering was also supposed to be given every Sabbath. That's Numbers 28, 9, and 10. Also, the beginning of each month, Numbers 28, 11. Also, a burnt offering was to be done at the Passover. That's Numbers 28, 19. As well as with new grain, first fruits offering at the Feast of Weeks. That's Numbers 28, 27. As well as at the Feast of Trumpets, at Rosh Hashanah. That's Numbers 29, 1. And at the new moon, Numbers 29, 6. Jesus is also our ultimate picture of a burnt offering. His body was not burned at the cross, but it was fully consumed for our benefit. The same reason why you do a burnt offering, Jesus fulfills that. Now let's talk about the wave offering, looking at verses 19 through 26. Take the other ram, and Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on its head, Slaughter it, take some of its blood, and put it on the lobes of the right ears of Aaron, his sons, and on the thumbs and the right hands, on the big toes of their right feet. Then splash blood against the sides of the altar, and take some blood from the altar and some of the anointing oil, and sprinkle it on Aaron and his garments, and on his sons and their garments. Then he and his sons and their garments will be consecrated. Take them, take from this ram the fat, the fat tail, the fat of the internal organisms, the long lobe of the liver, both kidneys with the fat on them, and the right thigh. This is the ram for the ordination. From the basket of bread made without yeast, which is before the Lord, take one round loaf, one thick loaf with olive oil mixed in, and one thin loaf. Put all these in the hands of Aaron and his sons and have them wave them before the Lord as a wave offering. Then take them from their hands and burn them on the altar along with the burnt offering for a pleasing aroma to the Lord, a food offering presented to the Lord. After you take the breast of the ram for Aaron's ordination, wave it before the Lord as a wave offering and it will be your share. So there's a lot of things that are in here as we've been going through this that, that are very specific traditions that are done, taking the blood and putting it on the horn of the bronze altar. Uh, we see here taking the blood and putting it on the earlobe, the thumb, and the big toe. Um, many scholars believe that this is uh, to remembrance of what you hear, what you do, and where you go are all dedicated to the Lord. There's a lot of stuff that's in here that I'm not going to get into extreme details. For one reason, um, well, we don't fully understand what all of these traditions meant or what they were for. The Bible does explain some of them, and many scholars have spent hours and years uh writing down different uh, theories of what the different things meant. Um, let me, just to hit on the wave offering and to give a little more insight, I'm actually going to read from um, Peter Enns uh, is the editor of the NIV Application Commentary for Exodus, and I'm going to read from page 535. Um, he sums this up quite nicely. It is not clear what a wave offering is. The phrase occurs about 20 times in the Pentateuch, but no description is given. Obviously, an act of waving is involved, but what purpose does the offering itself have? According to Leviticus 7, 28 through 36, a wave offering is a type of fellowship offering, the purpose of which concerns the establishing of communion between God and his people. This is the expected final to the consecration ceremony. The element of communion is further indicated in Exodus 29, verses 31 through 34, where Aaron and his sons eat a meal made up of the fellowship offering, as we have seen in 2411. Israel's leaders eat in God's presence. I, I love the honesty here. Um, 
it's not clear what a wave offering is. We don't exactly know. Uh, Exodus 29 is the first mentioning of a wave offering. We see it again in Exodus 35, verse 22, Exodus 38, 24. The people will present their gold as a wave offering to be used in the building of the tabernacle. Uh, Leviticus 7, 28 through 34 is part of a peace offering. Leviticus 8, 27 and 29, a wave offering as part of the consecration process for Aaron and his sons, which as I mentioned to begin with, Leviticus 8 mirrors this consecration process. Leviticus 14, verse 12 and verse 24 is a part of a cleansing process um, of a healed leper. Uh, Leviticus 23, 9 through 11, as part of the Feast of First Fruits, and then Numbers 8, verses 11 through 21, a wave offering is done in the um, consecration of the Levites. You can read for yourself all those different mentions of a wave offering and see what you learn from it um, and what you glean from Scripture. Continuing on, we're going to read verses 27 through 42, talking about how this is a lasting ordinance. Verse 27, Consecrate those parts of the ordination ram that belong to Aaron and his sons, the breast that was waved and the thigh that was presented. This is always to be perpetually share for the Israelites, for Aaron and his sons. It is the contribution the Israelites are to make to the Lord for their fellowship offerings. Aaron's sacred garments will be to his descendants so they so that they can be anointed and ordained in them. The son who succeed him as priest and comes to the tent of meeting to minister in the holy place is to wear them seven days. Take the ram of the ordination and cook the meat in a sacred place. At the entrance to the the tent of meeting, Aaron and his sons are to eat the meat of the ram and the bread that is in the basket. They are to eat these offerings by which atonement was made for their ordination and consecration. But no one else may eat them because they are sacred. And if any of the meat of the ordination ram or any bread is left over till morning, burn it up. It must not be eaten because it is sacred. Do for Aaron and his sons everything I have commanded you taking seven days to ordain them. Sacrifice a bull each day as a sin offering to make atonement. Purify the altar by making atonement for it and atone it to consecrate it. For seven days, make atonement for the altar and consecrate it. Then the altar will be the most holy, excuse me, then the altar will be most holy and whatever touches it will be holy. This is what you are to offer on the altar regularly each day. Two lambs a year old, offer one in the morning and the other at night. With the first lamb, offer a tenth of an ephah of the finest flour mixed with a quarter of a hin of oil from the pressed olives and a quarter of a hin of wine as a drink offering. Sacrifice the other lamb at twilight with the same grain offering and its drink offering as in the morning, a pleasing aroma, a food offering presented to the Lord." For the generations to come, this burnt offering is to be made regularly at the entrance of the tent of meeting before the Lord. We're going to stop there. So a few things I want to hit on. Uh, Verse 35 and 37, we have a reference to seven days. Again, seven, when you see it, almost always is a picture of perfection, picture of creation. Uh, It's God's number. And the reason why we get that is God created the earth in seven days. uh, And therefore, when you look at this, there is an element of a remembrance of creation and of perfection. Verse 40, we have two words that we don't regularly use, an ephah and a hin, H-I-N. An ephah is equivalent of about three and a half pounds, and a hen is a, the equivalent to about one quart or one liter. So those are just measurements as we're looking at um, the finest flour and oil um, from olives. Uh, then verses 29 through 30, as well as 38 and 42, all mention the fact that this is to be a lasting ordinance and that the dependents are to carry this on. This was a regular event. The consecration process started with consecrating 
Aaron and his sons as the high priest and the priest to go about the work of the tabernacle, but it is also outlining that these sacrifices in the morning and the evening um, and the burnt offerings, etc., were supposed to be continually done. Uh, there were daily, weekly, monthly, uh, yearly sacrifices that the work of the priests were supposed to do in the tabernacle. Numbers 28 verses 3 through 8 reads, each day, offer two rams a year old as sacrifices to please me. The animals must have nothing wrong with them. One will be sacrificed in the morning, the other in the evening. Along with each of them, one kilogram of your finest flour mixed with a liter of olive oil must be offered as a grain sacrifice. This sacrifice to please me was first offered at Mount Sinai. That's what we're talking about right now. Finally, along with each of these two sacrifices, a liter of wine must be poured on the altar as a drink offering. The second ram will be sacrificed that evening along with the other offerings, just like the one sacrificed that morning. The smell of the smoke from these sacrifices will please me. This is also a picture of the sacrifice that was to come in Christ. Now, actually, I want you to join me and let's flip to Hebrews. I've referenced Hebrews a lot because of the number of times that Hebrews references the, the, the tabernacle system, sacrifices, atonement, um, the high priests, all these different elements. But we're going to read Hebrews chapter 9. You could read the entire chapter. I'm just going to read the first 15 verses. Now, the first covenant had regulations for worship and also on an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up in its first room where the lamp stand and the table with its consecrated bread, that was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place, which had the golden altar of incense, the gold covered Ark of the Covenant. This Ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the covenant. Above the Ark were the cherubim of the glory, overshadowing the atonement cover, but we cannot discuss these things in detail now. I read that because it is a uh, great summary of what we've spent the last few weeks studying all of the different elements of the tabernacle. Continue on verse six. When everything had been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry, but only the high priest entered the inner room and that only once a year and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. This is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. Verse 11, but when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands. That is to say, not a part of this creation he did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit of offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. All of this points to Jesus. The sacrifices that were made by the high priest were atonements for a day, for a time, for a period, but it all points to the ultimate perfect sacrifice made in Christ. Finally, we're going to read uh, verses 42 through 46 of Exodus 29. 42 through 46. Um, For the generations to come, this burnt offering is to be made regularly at the entrance of the tent of meeting before the Lord. 
Continuing on. There I will meet you and speak to you. There also I will meet with the Israelites and the place will be consecrated by my glory. So I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar and will consecrate Aaron and his sons to serve me as priests. Then I will dwell among the Israelites and be their God. They will know that I am the Lord for their God. They will know that I am the Lord, their God, who brought them out of Egypt so that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord, their God. Verse 44, I will consecrate the tent of meeting and altar and will consecrate Aaron and his sons to serve me as priests. It is the Lord who calls people. It is the Lord who does the actual consecration. He is the one who sets them apart. That is an important thing to note is that we do all of these things, but if it's not of God, then it's useless. It is only when the consecration comes from the Lord that is true and pure. Now, the main point of chapter 29 and the main point of Exodus and the main point of our Bibles, I will dwell with them. They will know I am the Lord, their God, who brought them out of Egypt so that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord, their God. Exodus 25, 8. Then have them make a sanctuary for me. I will dwell among them. Leviticus 26, 12. I will walk among you and be your God and you will be my people. Zechariah 2.10, shout and be glad, daughter Zion, for I am coming and I will live among you, declares the Lord. John 14.17, the spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. 2 Corinthians 6.16, what agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. And then in Revelation 21, 3, in the future, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. At the very beginning in creation of man, Adam and Eve dwelt with the Lord and were in his presence. Revelation 21, three tells us in the end, we who believe will also dwell in the presence of God. What's happening in Exodus is God um, rescuing his people from the, cl the, the, the clutches of Egypt? Yes, but he is also sanctifying them, consecrating them, setting them apart as his people. The purpose of Exodus was not just to free the Hebrew slaves from Egypt, but to bring God's people into a covenant relationship with him through the law, the tabernacle, and the priesthood, which we've been studying. Exodus 6, 6 through 7, God's make, God makes this promise. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. That's the point of all of this, of the whole book. If you get nothing else, it is, is that God wants to have relationship with us. He wants to dwell with us and he wants us to dwell with him. And through Jesus' death on the cross, we receive the Holy Spirit. After his resurrection, he gave us the Holy Spirit at Pentecost so that, that the Spirit can actually now live in us. We are a tabernacle in and of itself. We are a, a dwelling place for the Lord to live with us. But then in heaven, we will be able to dwell in God's presence. And what we see in the tabernacle is God creating a place where he can dwell with his people under those confines of the time of the day. But then through Jesus, the Holy Spirit, all of it, all of it, all of it points to and shows us God's love for us and his desire to have us, his creation, dwell with him. So my challenge for you today, as you go about your busy days and, and you look at all these things that are just busy, 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 
Do you take time to just pause and realize what God has done for you, how much he loves you, and how much he wants you to call on him and to have him be a part of your day-to-day life? He's done everything to bring you into him, to rekindle, to reestablish that relationship with you that was broken at the fall. He's done everything. All you got to do is open that door. That door. Uh, Revelation 3.20, I stand at the door and I knock. And for those that hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and eat with them and they with me. That is a word not given to unbelievers, but it's actually given to the church in Laodicea, to a church group, calling them to open the door and actually have a relationship with God. So many people attend church and they know the right answers, but they don't have a, a... a quality relationship with God where God is a part of every single moment of of their lives, not just the 90 minutes where they go to church once a week. He wants to be a part of all of it. It's not that we should just have a God box that we open up on Sunday morning, but that God should be in every single box of every single aspect of our lives. That's my challenge for you. How you doing on that? Pray on that. Meditate on that. And realize that that God wants you to have his peace and his joy in the midst of the turmoil and the chaos of this life. It's ours to tap into. All you got to do is open that door. Lord, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you that your desire is to dwell with us. That's so profound and we thank you for that. Help us to open that door and allow you to come in and sanctify us, change us from the inside out. And thank you, Lord, that we will be able to dwell in your presence for eternity. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Next week, we're going to be talking about the altar of incense and the bronze basin, as well as uh, oil and incense, etc. So join me next week as we wrap up the specifics of the creation of the tabernacle and all of its elements. We're not done with the tabernacle by any means, but we're done with God giving the specific instructions to Moses on how to do these things. Love you guys, and I'll see you next week.